I think oh, cool. You were two years. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. But, well, I did my MS and many degrees but from here. Um, but yeah, I think it's overlap. Yeah. Cool. But you've returned? Yeah, so I'm faculty now. Nice. Excellent. And what are you teaching? Um, I actually am teaching a nutrition science class, which cool. is funny. Um, no, no, no. Yes, yeah. Were you also a FPAN person? Oh, for my PhD, yes. Yeah. And I was not calm for my MS. Cool. And then um, I was at NIH for six mm -hmm. years. And Very cool. Awesome. I'm excited about your talk last night. Um, yeah, hopefully it's fun. The room's going to fill up. Um, uh, it takes a while. I don't As doubt I, I know how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, Ed said he was going to make a brief announcement. Cool. You know, we'll try to, however long your talk is, take some questions at the end. Sure. Hopefully, and then, as I mentioned, we have a um, class that starts, like, right in the sentence. So okay, no problem. Yeah, yeah. That's a little fast, but... We can do that. I, I think that this should be just about 45, if not a little bit below 45, so... Uh, so should be all right. Okay, thank nice you. Nice to meet you. Can you just call your own questions at, at, at the end? Yeah. You know, your own. Sure. But I'll introduce you right here. Cool. But, um, also, have you been back to school since you got here? Yeah, a couple of times. But hanging out with Jenny and B. Research stuff, yeah. If you could ask a question when you get it. Sure. No problem. Yeah. Totally. We'll remind you. Appreciate it. Hey, man. Yeah, Hello. Good to see Great you. to see you. Can, uh, just state whether you intend to uh, uh, be, uh, be at the seminar um, and if you will uh, be at lunch uh, so we can know uh, exactly how to deal with space and, uh, and food ordering. Okay? Um, and there is an explanation on the link. Uh, uh, so even though this is uh, in the usual time, I'll ask you to RSVP. Thank you. All right, so I am super excited for this seminar. I'm Will Masters, a professor in the school, and really happy to be able to welcome back Alex Blau. Uh, Alex graduated uh, from the Friedman School just in 2012, um, but he had the foresight, the energy that will be displayed in, in the talk, um, to get a job doing, doing this, the kind of work he'll, he'll talk about. And this is a great week to have this seminar. Um, if you happen to notice the Nobel Prize in Economics, was awarded on Monday for precisely this kind of work. And the firm that Alex works for doing this um, for private enterprises, governments around the world, uh, was founded by academics to bring the kind of work that he'll, he'll talk about um, to the world. So it's really a pleasure to, to welcome Alex. Um, look forward to talk. Cool. Thank you, Will. Hey, everybody. I remember sitting where you were sitting right now. So thanks for coming out to hear me chat about behavioral science. Um, also, uh, I'm never really nervous for these talks, but my parents and sister are sitting in the crowd. So now I'm a little bit nervous, but hopefully we can, we can make it through without too much trouble. Behavioral science. Um, so today I want to go over a few things. Hopefully I'll be able to explain to you what I do a little bit more. Um, but also, I want to I be able to seat our thinking about behavioral science and decision making um, in this conversation about context and why context is really important in understanding why people do the things that they do. Uh, we'll talk through some key psychologies that I think might be interesting and fun for you all to think about and may be applicable to the work that you're doing or may do in the future. Um, and then I'll give you a little bit of an example about what I do in practice uh, for, for Ideas 42. So what is Ideas 42? Uh, we're a behavioral design nonprofit. We use insights from behavioral economics and psychology to design solutions to real world social problems. Uh, so basically, anywhere where people are making decisions or taking action, uh, we probably have something to say about it. We were founded by academics, leaders in the field, uh, in the fields of both psychology as well as behavioral uh, economics, who were interested in taking a lot of the insights uh, that had been generated over the 30 odd plus years of work within this field and apply them to real world problems. So take them out of academia, take them out of universities and try to solve some critical challenges with it. 
And today, uh, we work with lots of different partners in lots of different areas, um, and in many, many countries around the world. Uh, so I get to travel, which I'm generally very excited about. So today, I'm hoping that I can teach you a little bit about behavioral science, and in doing so, you'll be able to start seeing the problems that you're dealing with on a regular basis a little bit differently, that I can share a slightly different perspective and explain to you how cognition is going to impact the decisions and actions that people take and help you to better understand why you see the beneficiaries that you're working with on a regular basis doing what they're doing as opposed to maybe what you would like for them to do. And hopefully, I can also give you some tools that you can take home with you uh, to work on some of these challenges in your own time and in your research work. But before we begin, I'd like to play a little game, and I'd like to have everybody with me. Uh, I'm going to show you shapes and colors on the screen, and I want you to just yell out at the top of your lungs what color you see. Can we do one, one just test? Oh, it is. It's blue here. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to go through this pretty quickly. So I just want you to, to bear with and, and rapid fire name off these colors. Ready, set, go. Yellow, green, orange, brown, red, blue, red. Okay. So that was kind of fun, right? It's an easy thing, but when you stop paying attention, it gets hard. It's weird. But this is an important thing. This is called a Stroop test. A uh, Stroop test is a test of self-control, executive function. Uh, as you can see, it was a little bit harder than you probably assumed it was going to be, um, but I think it teaches a very important fact, which is that when you're not paying attention, sometimes you do things that you didn't intend to do. But before we go on and talk, start talking a little bit more about behavioral science in particular, I want to take a small tangent. I know this is the beginning of the conversation, so tangents are kind of weird to do right off the bat, but hey, why not? This is a B-17 bomber. It was one of the most technologically advanced planes during the period. Uh, it helped us to win the war. Um, lots of legroom, but it had this really weird problem with the landing gear. Um, this beautiful plane uh, would come into land, and right before landing, the pilots would retract the landing gear, sending the plane flat belly into the tarmac. And this was a problem. These were expensive planes. And the Air Force had an old adage. They say, excellent airmen commit no errors. They believed very much that if you were really good at what you were doing, if you're a really good airman, then you wouldn't do this thing. And so they thought to themselves, well, what can we do to improve our airmen? Of course, what we should do is just give them more training. And so they trained them more. The problem was that in training them more, they didn't solve the problem. The pilots would still continue to retract the landing gear, the planes would come belly flat, and the country would lose a little bit more money. And it took this psychologist, this guy by the name of Alphonse Chapanis, to look at this problem a little bit differently. He recognized that there was another set of pilots that were flying a very similar plane called the C-14, which is a cargo plane, but very similar spec. And there was no problem with this plane. They were landing it perfectly every single time. And so he said to himself, you know, there must be something else going on here. It must not be about the pilots. It must be about something that the pilots are doing, or the environment that the, that the pilots are in. And so what he did is, he went and he took a look into the cockpit. And in doing so, he noticed something really interesting. So when a pilot is supposed to land the plane, there's a lever they're supposed to pull that's going to tip the wing, flips, uh, wing flaps up. And in doing so, it tips the nose, and you can kind of come down on a nice landing. But what he found when he went into the cockpit was that the, the, the handle, the lever that was going to be used to tip the wing flaps, was right next to and looked exactly the same as the landing gear lever. There was no differentiation. And you can imagine these pilots, right? You know, they're trying to land these planes, they're very concerned, they're looking out in front of them at the tarmac, and they're sort of grasping at these levers, and they pull the wrong one. And so he made a very simple change. He just changed the, the knobs on the tops of these uh, these levers to be able to provide some tactile feedback to, uh, to these pilots and solve the problem off the bat. And I think this is really important because it teaches us something that, that I think we take for granted. Um, oftentimes, we'll believe very much that it's about the person that we need to fix. It's the person we need to fix. We need to train them better. We need to incentivize them to do something. When in fact, there may actually be something going on in the context in which they're making decisions or taking action that's causing the behavior that you see. So any intervention you do to improve their knowledge or improve their willingness or intention to follow through on something may not fix the problem if you're not addressing these contextual or environmental issues. 
But I also think that this helps us to learn a little bit about how we should think about human beings, the models we should use. It's not about knowledge, then what is it about? And how should we think about people in that regard? So in classical economics, I know Will and Sean have probably taught you this before, we hold this rational actor model, right? That people are going to be able to integrate a lot of information, that they weigh the costs and benefits of decisions, and they're going to optimally decide with respect to their utility. They look kind of like this guy, Spock, <laughs> right? And I like Spock. I think he's cool, but I don't think that I'm like Spock. And I have a feeling that a lot of you probably don't think that you're like Spock either. So maybe instead of Spock, we should think about humans a little bit differently. Maybe they need a lot of help. Maybe they don't have self-control. Maybe they're kind of like this guy. You know, dumb, lovable, likes donuts, maybe a little bit too much. But I don't think this is right either. I don't think this gives credence to human beings and really their, their sort of quirkiness. Instead, I think that people are kind of more like this guy. Brad Pitt with a really gross, weird beard. <laughs> right? Generally smart, generally thorough, but sometimes they do some weird things. And that's what I really want to highlight for you today. In the classical economic model, we believe very much that we can impute people's intentions from their actions. That revealed preferences are more important than stated preferences. But I would argue that the reality is that human beings are actually quite inconsistent. And I wish that I was the one who have found this. <laughs> this is great, right? People want to go work out, but they're going to take the escalator to get there. Imagine if they just didn't have escalators. They'd probably take the stairs. Context. So this is really the picture that I think about when I think about human beings. That they're inconsistent sometimes. And understanding why is important. So let's, let's delve a little bit into some psychologies. Let's go all the way back to when we were kids, to when the most important question we could have asked ourselves was how many marshmallows we wanted. So there's this really cool experiment. And it's this really wonderful form of torture. You sit a child down in a blank room. You put a marshmallow down in front of them. You say, I'm going to leave for five minutes. If I come back and the marshmallow is still there, I'll give you another marshmallow. And you know, a rational person would say, like, I'm totally going to get those two marshmallows. I want those two marshmallows. They're really yummy. But what we find is when you do this, the result is that it's hard. <laughs> you know? You see that thing, it's sitting right in front of you. It's tempting you. You said you wanted those two marshmallows. And then all of a sudden, that one marshmallow is really calling to you. And eventually, you just can't help yourself. There are videos of this, if you're interested, and they are great. <laughs> the kids use these crazy techniques to be able to get around this, uh, this self-control problem. Sometimes they'll, they'll maneuver their chair so they're not facing the marshmallow anymore. They'll sit underneath the desk. You know, but they're really struggling. I feel this pain. But I think that we, we actually deal with this marshmallow problem on a regular basis, all of us. I do it every day. In fact, I did it today. So you set your alarm in the morning, right? Because you're like, I'm gonna wake up early and go work out. Be a healthy person, right? And you go to bed, you're all excited. And then at some point, at like 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, there's this blaring noise in your ear. And you say to yourself, who is that jerk that set this alarm? And the thing that's great about it is that the alarm clock is give you an out. They give you a contextual out in the form of a snooze button. And so you can just press the snooze button and go, to, go back to sleep again. But I would argue that you actually wanted to get out of bed. You know? The you at 11 o'clock at night seems to be very different from the you at 6 o'clock in the morning. But I would argue that in a global sense, the 11 o'clock you is probably the one that is real. You really do want to work out. You want to be a healthy person. But there's this weird contextual thing that's getting in your way. So some folks at MIT actually had a really great idea. They said, let's just change the alarm clock. Let's make it better. Let's make it far more annoying. And they created a clocky. So clocky is an alarm clock on wheels. When the alarm clock goes off, it rolls off your desk and hides in a random space in the room. <laughs> it makes a lot of really, really terrible noise. And by the time you have found this thing and turned it off, you're already out of bed and you're awake. 
and it makes it much more likely that you're going to be able to follow through. And there are other solutions like this, too. You know, maybe you have to solve a math problem or do a puzzle or something along those lines. Um, you know, people have been thinking about some really fascinating ways of dealing with this problem. But, you know, we're, we're not really talking about waking up early. You know, this inconsistency runs rampant through lots of different decisions. And I would argue that this, this similar inconsistency happens uh, even in the work that we do on a regular basis, um, especially when it comes to, oh, I'll get back to that. So, participation. How many of you regularly aspire to exercise on a regular basis? Cool. How many of you have a concrete plan about how to do so? Keep your hands in the air. How many of you followed through on that plan today? That's great. So generally when I ask this question, you can imagine that a lot of people put their hands down. It speaks to this inconsistency, that we have this intention, we have this plan, but we just don't follow through. But again, similar problem when it comes to fertilizer purchase, right? So there's this really weird context with farmers. We all know this. Uh, farmers live a cyclical life. They live by the harvest cycle. At the beginning of the year, they're very poor. At the end of the year, they're quite rich because they've been able to sell all their goods. And when they sell, if you were to ask them, how many of you have an intention to purchase fertilizer for the next season, you'll have almost 100% of them say, like, absolutely, I would love to do this. Yes, please, let's do it. But if you were to offer it to them, at the end, right before they start to plant, not many of them are going to have cash left over. It's a self-control problem, right? You have to ration that money over the period of time that you're going to be there. You'll probably spend a little bit more at the beginning than you will at the end, similar to the SNAP problem that, that Park was able to expose. And so how might we be able to design a solution around this problem? Well, some researchers said, let's actually just give them a voucher at the time of harvest and we'll do deliveries at the time of planting. And when they offered this to prepay, basically pre-commit to this sale, people were able to exhibit a significantly higher amount of self-control without even exhibiting self-control. They put the money away first. And in the end, many more farmers used fertilizer. So self-control is kind of funny. And this is one of my favorite experiments. Um, because it, the way that we exhibit self-control has a lot to do with the cues that are in our, our environment, what we pay attention to, and how we pay attention. And in this experiment, uh, the researchers were great. It was uh, this guy, Brian Wozanek, uh, who's at the Cornell Food Lab. And he set up an experiment trying to assess uh, how people would eat soup and how much they would eat. And so in one treatment condition, he just gave them a bowl of soup and said, eat as much as you want. In another treatment condition, he did the same exact thing. But there was a catch. That soup bowl had a tube underneath it. And it was pumping more soup in the more the people were eating. So the line of soup wasn't actually going down at all. right? And what he found was, if you continue to pump soup in, and no one sees the line go down, people eat a lot more soup. Right? So why is it that we, we probably believe that satiety is probably the thing that we're going to pay more attention to in this context? That I feel satiated, I don't want to eat anymore, but our preferences seem to be mediated by the fact that there's this line that doesn't change, which seems almost arbitrary to the context in some degree, right? But it's not. It makes a huge difference. Attention also becomes problematic in our lives when we move through life automatically. This was the very first seminal experiment that was conducted in real life, um, exposing this idea of, uh, of blindness, attentional blindness. And in this experiment, what happened was uh, one of the researchers uh, interdicted somebody on the, on the sidewalk in the middle of the university, asked them for directions, and in the middle of this interaction, two guys carrying a board passed through both of them, and one of them switched places with the person who was asking directions. The coolest part about this is that the person who was giving those directions did not notice. They just carried on with their conversation. And this is actually an experiment that we run when we're doing uh, you know, master classes and stuff like that, and it works almost every single time. It's crazy. You move through life automatically, you're going to miss a lot of details, which makes it really important for us to make things salient when it's important to make them salient so that people don't neglect those details. One way we can do that is through reminders. If we want someone to save, for instance, 
We can either say, we're not going to do anything, we're going to leave it up to them. If they have an intention to save, then they're going to follow through on their own. And if they don't want to save, that's their issue, right? But maybe the reason that they're not saving is not because they didn't want to, but because they just forgot to. So maybe sending them a reminder to save is important. And so in this example, uh, what they did was they basically sent out two different kinds of reminders. One was a generic reminder just saying, save. But the other one was a goal-based reminder. And I find this super fascinating. If you remind people, it definitely improves their ability to, to save and their willingness to do it. But if you remind people why they were going to save in the first place, what they had intended to do with that money, it makes them much more likely that they're going to save. There's a, a concept in behavioral science called construal level theory. It's a very fancy name for a not so fancy idea. Things that are more abstract are harder for us to take action on than things that are concrete. You give people abstract steps, abstract reasons, they may not necessarily follow through at the same rates that if you gave them very concrete steps and concrete reasons. So it's important for us to be concrete with people about their intentions, especially if we're going to remind them about them. Choice is also a sort of funny thing about human beings. Humans love choice. We love having options. We think it's like a really important value that we espouse and try to build into a lot of the types of work that we do. The ironic thing is that despite the fact that we like choice, we often hate choosing. So this is an experiment that was run uh, out in California by uh, these two researchers. They went into what was effectively like a Dean and DeLuca's and set up two different jam stations. One that had six jams and one that had 21 jams. All different types. Boysenberry and elderberry and gooseberry and you know, persimmon or you know, whatever else they could think of. And what they found was more people stopped by when there were more options, but fewer people purchased. So it was intriguing. People thought that having choice was a, a great way to, you know, it's a very attractive thing to see choice. But when we're presented with many options, and I know that you've probably experienced this if you go into Chinatown and you see some of those menus, and unless you have a default option that you go to every time, because I love Gourmet Dumpling House and I'll totally eat all of their pork dumplings, uh, that it's sometimes really hard to choose. Sometimes you don't choose is the outcome. You provide people with too much choice, you end up just searching through Netflix the entire night without choosing a movie to watch. So it's important for us to also think about when we're providing choice to people, how to facilitate that choice so it's not too hard and that we can get people to actually make a decision for themselves as opposed to avoid it altogether. Choosing can also be difficult when we're not really comparing things well. So in this, you know, vendor L may seem like the ripe choice. Look at it, it's overflowing. It looks like a lot of ice cream, right? But if we were to just look at vendor L, We'd probably say that looks really great. If we were to look at just vendor H, we'd be like, oh, they totally skimped. Did not give us a lot of ice cream. When we separately evaluate things, it makes it harder for us to be able to distinguish the differences between them. And sometimes visual cues like this are going to totally mess us up. Which is why sometimes it's important for us to evaluate things conjointly. It allows us to be able to see those differences in meaningful ways and not be biased by some of the visual cues that we might see. And speaking of visual cues, this is a cool experiment. So some researchers uh, went into um, a parking garage and threw trash all over the floor. And then what they did was they measured to see how many other people coming into that parking garage were going to put trash on the floor as well. They then compared this to a time where they completely cleaned the parking garage. And I think you can expect what they found. Anyone want to give a guess? not that unintuitive. More trash where there was more trash, right? But why? Well, one thing that humans do is we often learn from each other, right? I think we like to think of ourselves as being independent individuals with minds of our own, but the reality is that we often do what we see other people doing because we learn social cues from those individuals. Social norms are very important in that regard. And so if you've seen that other people feel like it's okay to throw trash on the ground, as shown by all the trash that's on the ground, you're going to be much more likely to do the same. But if we make it seem as though people don't do that, then you probably won't. And this becomes problematic sometimes because when we're telling people about what other people do, we want to make sure that we're highlighting the right things as opposed to the wrong things. There's a, a poster that I once saw 
of uh, showing uh, dropout rates in New York, and they were able to show an image of human beings stacked to the, the height of the Empire State Building in terms of the number of people that had dropped out. And I had to question whether or not that was a good message to send, because what people might in, 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 intuit from that is that other people are doing it too, so it must be okay. So we need to be careful about these sorts of things. I'm sorry that this image didn't work out, but it's also a really interesting intervention that leverages the same idea. So there's this organization called OPower, based out of Virginia initially. I think they're now subsumed by Oracle, or subsumed into Oracle. Um, but what they did is they provided uh, this infographic along with energy bills. Um, some of your parents may have this, you may have received this yourself. And what it does is it compares you and your energy use against your average neighbors in your neighborhood and against the most efficient neighbors in your neighborhood. And what they found on average, there's some very interesting subgroup analysis if you're interested, but on average what they found was just showing them this thing actually reduced energy consumption on a per household basis by about two percentage points. And that may seem small, but at scale, we're talking you know, in, in, in a market like in Oregon that was like $900 million saved per year. Almost the equivalent of the cost of the Hoover Dam, right? Saved per year. So just showing people what other people are doing can be a very powerful incentive to cause people to change their behavior, especially if that behavior is positive. How we frame things is also quite important. It's not just about how we relate to other people, but how we see specific information um, and the way that it's presented. So in this experiment, uh, what the researchers did is, um, at a point when uh, other researchers in a lab were receiving income, um, they actually framed that income in two different ways. One was either as a rebate, and one was as a bonus. So you either really get repaid for something that you were owed, or you get a bonus on top of what you were already receiving. And what they found was just simply framing this thing as either a rebate or a bonus had significant effects on the way in which that money was being used. When framed as a rebate, people didn't spend it as much. But when framed as a bonus, people were much more likely to go out and use that money. Interesting. And it's sort of this weird feature, right? It's a non-economic feature. It's not an incentive. It's not information asymmetry. It's just a label that we put on this. And it seems to really affect how people decide with respect to their resources. But we can do this in other ways as well. And I was actually really pleased to see that you have these signs on your own trash cans around here. You're framing trash as landfill, and it goes back to this construal question, helps to make more vivid what the consequences of not throwing it away, or of throwing it away are relative to recycling, right? If you see everything as being trash, it's just trash, but if you recognize that it's going to go to some place and pile up, then you might be less likely to put it into the trash can as opposed to into the recycling bin. So these framing things are actually quite important as well. Cool. So let me pose you another question. Raise your hands with the responses. You're going to buy a calculator. Calculator costs $100. So you go into the store. The store clerk says, hey, we have another store. It's a 10-minute walk away. You can get that same calculator for 50 bucks." How many of you would walk down the street to, to get that? Cool. It's like everybody. Sweet. All right. New situation. You're buying a leather jacket. Maybe it's a, a computer. I don't know. Leather jacket costs $2,000. Very expensive. And you go into the store to buy the thing. It looks really nice. You're like, ah, oh, it's good leather. Good. And the store clerk says, we have another store 10 minutes down the drive. And you can get the same jacket for $1,950. How many people would go down the street? <laughs> so this is, a, this is weird, right? Will, is this weird? Yes. Sean, is this, is this weird? Yeah. It's weird. Why do we have different perceptions? I mean, the time value of money in this situation is the same. 10 minutes, $50. We do it in one scenario. We don't do it in another. That seems to be highly inconsistent. We're talking about the same individual sitting in the same seats right now, right? What's going on here? Well, we think about it in terms of proportion, right? 50% off versus like a $50 reduction on $2,000. It's like chump change. I might as well just stick around here. But I think it actually says something new is that low-income individuals were way more consistent, way more consistent in answering this question than high-income individuals. If I'm cash-strapped and you're offering to save me $50, I'm going to save myself $50 every single time, without question. But because I'm a wealthier individual, 
It's chump change when compared to the $2,000 I'm about to spend. And that's weird. It also indicates that in some cases, lower income individuals may actually adhere closer to the rational actor model that we would assume um, under you know, conditions of scarcity. But there's something else that's happening that I really want to talk about. Scarcity. And I'm not talking about economics, right? Economics is the study of scarcity, scarce resources, decision making under scarcity. I'm asking about what are the psychological effects of scarcity? And how should we think about interacting with our clients who are under these conditions? So the context of scarcity is important, and the context of income volatility is also important. Because you can imagine that if you have volatile income, you're going to be scarce in your resources sometimes, flush in others. And what are the implications of that? So I think about the psychology of scarcity kind of like this. Winston Churchill had this great quote, an Englishman's mind works best when it's almost too late. And I know a number of you have probably been like working on papers and stuff like that, right? It's really hard to start working on that as soon as the assignment comes, but when it's time to turn that thing in, man, your mind is working like fire. But Susan Sontag also says this thing, she says, to photograph is to frame, and to frame is to exclude. And I bet you that you're not doing nearly as much laundry when you're working on that paper. You're not taking care of the small things that you generally take care of. Your focus is 100% on that thing that you need to get done, and the rest of the world kind of just falls off a bit. And that's really what the context of scarcity is about. And the problem is, you know, these lower income individuals who, under these conditions of scarcity, seem to be more economically rational. Are, 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 this is true, but only in a point of time. If you're asking someone to make a trade-off decision today, they're going to make a totally rational decision in managing the fire of money that they need to deal with. But if you're asking them to think about the future, I might be willing to put myself in greater debt to be able to deal with my needs today than I would otherwise, right? And that can be very problematic. People may not think about the long-term consequences of today's decisions if they're functioning on trying to get things done today and manage their needs today. And what's super interesting about this is that this condition of scarcity, this attentional issue, is kind of like a resource, right? Our attention, we can only have so much of it. We can only put it towards so many things. And scarcity actually takes up a lot of that, that cognitive bandwidth. And so there's this really interesting examination that was done. Uh, some researchers went into a mall in New Jersey, and they went up to people, and they asked them one of two questions. It was an, either an economically easy question or a financially difficult question. And it goes something like this. You need to get to work. Your car breaks down. You can't get to work. You need to get it fixed. You have to you take it in, and the guy says, it's going to cost you $300 to repair. Cool. The second scenario, it costs $3,000 to repair. And they primed people with this statement. So they just presented this statement had them think about it, and then they, and they did two things. One was a Stroop test, so very similar to the thing that I, I gave you at the very beginning of this talk. And the second was uh, a Raven's matrices test, which is a test of, of cognition. It's basically like asking you how you can solve problems, puzzles. And then what they did, after they received all this data, um, they, they did some uh, subgroup analysis looking at lower income individuals versus higher income individuals. And what they found was the higher income individuals depending on what question they were asked, or the, the scenario they were given, didn't really perform any differently. Same scores on the Stroop test, same scores on the Raven's matrices test. But what they found amongst the lower income individuals was that there was a huge difference when primed with the hard question as compared to the easy one. Lower scores on both, to the degree that it was about a 12 point difference in like IQ, which, is meaningful. If you think about it, you're like average IQ, 12 points below is basically deficient, 12 points above is genius. You know, it's a very meaningful change in that regard. If you buy into IQ tests, I don't really buy into IQ tests. But the idea is that it's harder for people under these conditions to be able to uh, use executive function, to be self-controlled, but also just to think, to solve problems. So I know that was a little bit of a contrived experiment, right? We're not talking about match groups. We can't really tell whether or not you know, the, the things that we're seeing are, uh, are uh, within these individuals. And so another examination was done looking at uh, cane farmers 
and using the fact that income is cyclical, right? Poor before harvest, rich after harvest. And so what they did is they administered the same kinds of tests. And what they found was the exact same result. Right before harvest, those farmers did way worse on these Raven's matrices and Stroop tests, and right afterwards did way better. Same farmers. Different context. Your mind is working completely differently during those different periods of time. And that has implications on things like, am I going to be better at rationing my income? Am I going to be more persistent in properly applying my agronomic practices? Am I going to properly deal with my familial needs? Income smoothing could be very important in these contexts. But to give you all a bit more of a visceral sense of what this is like, I can figure out where the yada. I want to run a, a quick, fun little game. So I'm going to play a video. And what I'd like for you to do is count how many times the players wearing, a white, uh, wearing white pass the ball. If you've seen this before, don't whisper in anyone's ear. All right? And just play this game with me. Cool. The correct answer is 16. All right, so who got 16? How many of you saw the gorilla? Cool. So some of you probably knew the gorilla was going to be there. But how many of you saw that the background changed color? How many of you saw that one of the black players disappeared? Cool. So even when we know what we should be looking for, we miss the other details as well. And again, this comes back to the scarcity example. Your mind is focused on one thing, and you neglect the rest, even though those changes are happening around you. So I think it's really important for us to, to think about that when we're designing interventions, programs, for people who are dealing with these kinds of contexts, because it means that we can't just assume that they're going to have the self-control they need. We can't assume that they're going to be able to solve the problems that we're asking them to solve. And we, as designers of those programs, really need to think about how we can support them, fill in those gaps, be able to provide them a little bit more bandwidth when they need it. So today we talked about four key things. Context is everything. Look for those intention action gaps. Look for when people say they want to do something and they don't follow through on it. Psychologies can help you better understand these sol solutions to some of these problems and also understand those problems and that scarcity really exacerbates all of this. So what do I do? I'll give you an example of what I work on. So at Ideas42, we use this design methodology. It looks pretty similar to like any human-centered design methodology. Um, the big difference is that we infuse a lot of behavioral science into the process, um, and that we really work to define these problems in terms of the behaviors we want to see as opposed to the behaviors that we're seeing. Uh, but we'll go through this process. We'll work with firms to help to define what the nature of the problem is. We'll go in and do a lot of qualitative research to understand what we call behavioral bottlenecks are in place. Um, we'll design some solutions to address those bottlenecks, either as like a package of what we call nudges or uh, as a single intervention. And then we'll test them. We, we, we're an RCT shop, so we like to run ex evaluations and experiments uh, to see whether or not we're effective. Um, we have to be honest with ourselves about that. And so we worked with uh, this microfinance organization in the Philippines called CardBank. And CardBank came to us and said, hey, you know, we seem to be having this problem getting people to onboard to our account. And we really want more people onboarding to the savings account. We're providing them loans. We think that savings is important. And it would help us manage our risk, also help those individuals increase their liquidity to do things they might want to do. And so we looked at the data. We checked out their administrative information. And what we found was we didn't actually find a problem with onboarding people. Um, they actually had been very successful in onboarding new clients. But what the problem was is that over 58% of the accounts that had been opened were completely dormant. Not a single transaction had taken place. So people seemed to want to save, uh, but they didn't actually follow through with the savings. So it was for us a relatively clear intention action gap. 
When we went in and did the qualitative work to try to understand what might be going on, we found two key insights that we thought were driving this problem. The first was that they may not have a concrete goal to save for. So again, it goes back to this, this construal problem. Are they thinking very concretely about not just what they want to achieve, but how to achieve it, right? Is there a process? Um, but that it's also really hard to follow through when you don't have that in place. And so we did something really simple. We, uh, we administered a commitment and plan making exercise. And to just give you a sense of what this is kind of like, there's this really cool piece of research that was done by a UPenn researcher, Katie Milkman. And what she was trying to do was increase the number of individuals at a firm that would go get flu shots. And so they got one of three different conditions. One was just a, this is where you can go to get a flu shot, and here are the opening hours. The next was uh, an intervention that asked them to think about uh, the specific day of the week and the day of the month that they would go. And a final intervention actually asked them the specific time that they would go. So not only is this a planning intervention in some sense, but it also functions as a, a bit of a soft commitment as well. If you've made a very concrete plan about what you're going to do,